Finally, I got my foot in the door, so now I'm never gonna think about my MCAT score. I'm beginning my training on this path I've been chasing, no more waiting. I think it's gonna be amazing. I know just the type of doctor that I'm planning to be. Family med, cause the front lines are calling me. I want to plant this seed for the change I want to see. But when I say this, most PCPs disagree. They say, no, I don't think that's what you'll want to pursue. You see, your notion of what I do is misconstrued. EHRs and paperwork are what I attend to in lieu of patients. I feel like I'm wasting my training and I amassed a lot of debt throughout my education for insurance and referrals to be my occupation. It's not health, it's recording information, it's complacent. You don't want a lifetime of frustration. Doc, that's exactly why I need to do it. We need people who pursue it to improve it and renew it. If we lose primary care, can you imagine what would happen? We need to make a system where these doctors can be happy and be paid in an adequate way. Investing here ultimately helps the industry save. If we can honor these doctors and stimulate incentives, it'll foster a system that encourages prevention. That's how I know that I have to get involved. If we all abandon ship, the problems never get resolved. We're in a position to make a perfect system, but believe it first. Speak it into existence. As doctors and as students, it's crucial that we do this. Lay the blueprints first, then put the work in and produce this. Don't give up hope. The system thrives on submission. It's time we take our healthcare back from bureaucracy. Democrats and politicians. Hello and welcome to the Functional Forum. We've got an unbelievable show tonight. Thanks so much everyone for watching. We've got an epic lineup tonight of speakers. We've got an awesome panel here. Amazing group of functional doctors, technology activists uh, for here for Elite Board in Medicine. This is a great gathering. You know, our goal is to make it easy for practitioners to learn in community. There's a lot of community happening tonight. I want to say welcome uh, to all of the communities that are watching at home. This ecosystem that has been set up by the meetup groups we believe will be the future ecosystem of this evolved primary care network that we are looking to develop and it all revolves around you. There are meetups all over the country, all over the world. We want to bring functional medicine to the masses. We have a quarter of a million views and you can see it's starting to uptick. Our vision at the Evolution of Medicine and the Functional Forum is to empower 100,000 practices based on two principles root cause resolution and community health. There's an exponential potential to the future of medicine. This is an allopathic conversion machine that we have just created. <laughs> and it has exponential potential because it can be seen by a billion people at no extra cost. That's the beauty of the internet. Welcome to the Functional Forum, live from Boulder, Colorado. Thanks for joining us in the charge to accelerate the evolution of medicine. Please welcome your host, James Maskell. Welcome, Boulder. Welcome. So glad you're here. Very excited to be back in Boulder. Uh, I know a few of you made it last year. We had about two feet of snow, so no excuses this year. And so, uh, so glad to see all of you and be back in E-Town. This is by far the coolest venue that we do the Functional Forum in. And I can say that because I don't have any of my team here. I just came by myself. So thank you, E-Town, uh, for being such a great partner and working out the stream and the, the space. This is going to be an amazing show. I'm really excited about uh, what we have coming up for you uh, with the evolution of, of psychiatry tonight. Um, uh, for those of you who haven't guessed from my accent, I was born in Colorado and uh, I was born in Loveland. And so I just this weekend, I had a chance to go and uh, check out to see what's going on in Denver. Denver's kind of cool now. Didn't realize. Yeah, right? <laughs> Um, and so we took a walk around and I saw this, uh, this graffiti, uh, build locally, uh, spread globally. And it was really exciting for me to see it. And obviously I took a picture because we're in the business of building locally and spreading globally right now with the functional forum meetup groups. You saw, um, you know, already, uh, you know, what we said today is that we think that these functional forum meetup groups will be the ecosystem that this evolved primary care network comes out of. This, this whole year, we have the evolution. Last, year, last month, it was oncology. This month is psychiatry. Next month's cardiology. You know, and I don't mean to like ruin the surprise for everyone, but the truth is, is that the evolution of psychiatry, oncology, cardiology, primary care, neurology is all 
about the kind of medicine that we're talking about here because we need to go upstream, right? And we need to get upstream and stop these diseases before they become a problem. So next month, evolution of cardiology will be in Detroit, Michigan. 90% of strokes are reversible and are, are preventable. So what are we going to do? How are we going to get upstream? You know, and uh, that's what we're looking at tonight. So if you're watching this in one of the meetup groups, thank you very much. You know, it's a real gift for you just to show up to a meetup group. And communities are built around gifts and stories. So it's your gift. If you're watching this at home or you're watching this on the replay, start a group. Go to functional forum, uh, meetup.functionalforum.com or, you know, join a group. It's really, there's so much value that we're seeing from practitioners getting together into community and talking about these kind of topics. Topics, and, and we'll see some, we're seeing uh, real innovation in that area. So a warm welcome to everyone who's in the meetup groups. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, next month we have the evolution of cardiology. And, um, you know, cardiology is interesting because you have Dean Ornish as a character who's for 30 years has been plugging away to get his intensive cardiac rehab, firstly, clinically validated, and then secondly, paid for by Medicare. So you can get that now. You can get like a yoga teacher and Medicare will pay for it if you have heart disease. We need that for all the specialties. And that's why we're here to talk about psychiatry tonight because it's all very well for cardiology, but it's the same factors happening. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that tonight. So um, just to give you a little sort of piece of, of, of where that came from. So I came to this conference last year um, called uh, the International Congress for Integrative Health and Medicine. And um, it was incredible. There was the, the, it was held in Germany. We had PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization. The World Health Organization was there. They had the minister of Brazil, the health minister of Brazil. And what I learned there, no one really knows what they're doing when it comes to non-communicable disease. Right? America, if anything, is a little bit ahead of the game. I know we like to think maybe they're doing it better in Germany or they're doing it better here. It's not, it's not the case. So when I went there, I heard a talk by Scott Shannon. And Scott Shannon is a psychiatrist from Fort Collins. And uh, he's built an amazing program there. And that's what got me thinking about doing the, uh, the evolution of psychiatry in Colorado because there's a lot of innovation happening here. So I asked Scott, he's on vacation in Hawaii, couldn't get out of it, sent his friends to come and speak. Um, uh, but he sent me this video showing exactly how their practice works. So I'm going to start with this because I just feel like this will give you an idea of what the psych psychiatric practice of the future looks like. Hi, I'm Scott Shannon. I'm an integrative psychiatrist and one of the faculty from Psychiatry Masterclass. And today I'm here to tell you about Wholeness Center, a clinic I started about seven years ago. My inspiration for starting the clinic was quite simple. I'd been the medical director of a freestanding psychiatric hospital and run a number of different residential treatment centers, worked at a community mental health center, and had a large outpatient practice. But I could see that I could not meet the needs of my patients. I've been involved in holistic and integrative medicine for over 30 years, and I've seen a lot of the different things that could be done for people, but I never saw them together in one place in terms of treating mental health issues. So we started the clinic with a goal and a philosophy of creating collaborative care where people treated patients, individuals as a whole person, body, mind, spirit, and work together as a team to address root cause and leverage the power of things like epigenetics and neuroplasticity to our greatest benefit. We've created a program where we work with outpatients and we increasingly work with patients from out of the region and out of state in something called the Comprehensive Assessment Program, where people come in for a comprehensive assessment. We start out with lab work, which is both uh, urine and blood. We do a quantitative EEG. When they arrive on scene, they meet with an integrative psychiatrist, a naturopath, a family systems therapist, traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. And together we create a comprehensive picture of what's going on for them. And we pull together a treatment plan that is cohesive, comprehensive, and prioritized. We've got a team of people working that includes a whole range of practitioners. We've got 10 different disciplines represented and we work together as a cohesive team. And people get uh, classes for diet and nutrition, they get IV nutrition, stress reduction, and they get a program that works and is geared to them. 
We're held together by a practice manager, Leo Salazar, who really makes things hum and work together as a coherent, cohesive whole. And I'm really pleased that we've been able to try to shift the paradigm. On one level, we're simply a mental health clinic. We provide care. We've got 8,000 patients. We provide a lot of the mental health care for the Fort Collins region. But we also are trying to do something very different. And one of the things we're trying to do is we want to invite people to discover themselves and begin a path to healing and wholeness in a way that the field of psychiatry has really never seen before. My personal vision is to change my profession, shift the mental health paradigm, and really move people in a way towards health and healing that has not been part of our tradition in psychiatry. So I'm really pleased at what we've been able to do, and I'm really excited about Wholeness Center. Let's have a round of applause for Scott Shannon and what he's built. His two uh, partners at the Integrated Psychiatry Masterclass are going to be speaking tonight, so you're going to get an idea of what they're teaching other psychiatrists. But, you know, to me, that the collaborative care team, the efficiency of using the naturopathic doctors, the psychiatrists, and the coaches uh, all together in a team and having that cohesive unit, this is the kind of practice that can scale, and this is the kind of practice that can really solve the root cause of these psychiatric conditions. So very, very excited to see that um, uh, coming together. So, you know, as I was starting to uh, put together this show and uh, we came up, okay, we're going to do the evolution of psychiatry, um, you know, as we like to know here, we try and make it fun, we try and make it interesting. Our goal at the Functional Forum was to try and make something that doctors would want to watch rather than something that they just get forced to watch for CME credit. And so I always like to uh, blood new talent here on the Functional Forum. So, uh, you know, just about when we came up with the idea for this, I saw that video that we shared at the beginning, um, Primary Care Dreams, and uh, had a chance to connect with uh, Jamie Katuna. And I sent her a bunch of things uh, that if you registered for this show, you would have got Kelly Brogan's uh, Evolution of Psychiatry from the third ever Functional Forum back in 2014 and a bunch of other assets. And, uh, you know, I said, do you want to do a live rap on the show? So uh, <laughs> she, uh, she said yes. And so please welcome to the stage medical student turned rapper Jamie Katuna. Can I kick it? 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 Thanks for having me. Um, so I am going to perform a spoken word. It's not rap to music, it's spoken word. Um, and it's called Positive Psychiatry. Psychiatry. It is undeniably complex. And there's a lot I don't know, so I can't pretend. But I can use a lens of, of paradigm shifts, of transforming this culture from historical trends. In the US now, we use a lot of meds and we overspend, they profit on our dependence. Even though the data shows those who need drugs most are the ones who actually tend not to get them. And so the DSM, it continues to grow from a leaflet to an encyclopedia, but this focus on disorders, it's not really helping people. DSM expansion is just a fraction of what's needed. This is not how we want to build the future, diagnosing symptoms like we're programmed computers, letting Big Farm use doctors like recruiters. Patients are still confused on what they're going through. They feel demoralized with stigmatization because mental health is being answered with incarceration. It makes no sense as the wealthiest nation to not invest in preventive education. But why does society try to turn psychiatrists into drug dealing bad guys? These are allies. We need them on our side. A better way to do health that we could all try is called positive psychiatry. It's resilience, optimism, introspection, family, environment, and social connection. We need to be involved in preventive intervention, not just used to medicate neurosis, making sure there's an underlying diagnosis. 
The DSM is a human construction. The whole thing used to be homophobic. Mental health care can be better. Physicians leading, patients at the center. But the reason I know we'll succeed with this endeavor is people like you who accept nothing lesser. Thank you. Awesome, so good. Thank you, Jamie. Let's make a massive round of applause to start for Dr. Janice Ethel and Dr. Will Van Der Veer. Thank you, thank you, James. Thank you, James. Thank you so much to Functional Forum for this invitation. We're so excited about the future of psychiatry and about integrative psychiatry, but honestly, we didn't start out excited about psychiatry, did we? No, we didn't. <laughs> so um, I finished my residency in the early 2000s, and it took me a couple of years to quickly realize that the tools that I had learned didn't work all that well. I had a lot of people in my practice who were falling into the category of treatment resistant. There were people who had ongoing symptoms, people who didn't respond to medications, people who had a lot of side effects to medications. And what ended up happening was I got really frustrated and decided that it was time for me to go and find some better tools. So I started in uh, 2004, got my board certification, and by May of that year, I was ready to quit psychiatry and go looking for better tools. So it didn't take me too long. And he did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So in 2004, I quit psychiatry and I decided that I was going to find some better tools. And one of the best things that happened to me was I ran into a former patient who I treated for about a year. And he was really representative of what was wrong with psychiatry for me. He was a guy in his 30s. He was an entrepreneur. He was very anxious. He couldn't work. He couldn't date, he couldn't drive, he couldn't fly, he was paralyzed with panic and anxiety. And I treated him with the usual techniques that I learned in my residency. I gave him cognitive therapy, SSRI, and benzodiazepine. And after about a year of treatment, he still wasn't better. So when I ran into him, he said, look, you know, after you left town, I went and got tested for celiac disease. I came back positive. I stopped eating gluten. And within a few months, my anxiety was gone. I stopped my medications, and still my anxiety was gone. I just talked to him a few weeks ago. It's now been more than 10 years since we had that first conversation, but I'm really grateful to him. He's doing great. Um, what happened was he was able to go ahead and start his business. He could travel. He could do whatever he wanted. He, st he started a family. So he was a huge instrument in putting me right on the path to looking for root causes in psychiatry. So I thank him. So I went out and looked for my lever, like Archimedes, looking for the long lever to move uh, the earth. Next. Oops. Yeah, I'll click the slides for you. Okay, thanks. So um, I had my own crisis a couple years after I, f I finished my residency in 1993. And within a couple years, I started having this sawdust sickness. And uh, I couldn't get the words out of my mouth when I was talking with my clients. And long story short, as I figured out, it was because I didn't believe the words that I was saying. <laughs> and uh, that was a crisis for me. Will got to quit. I didn't get to quit. Okay, I was up to my eyeballs and loans. I couldn't, uh, you know, I needed to make it work. So I was in crisis. And what I did was simultaneously, I signed up for the advanced psychotherapy training at the local analytic institute, and I hedged my bets by also apprenticing myself to my acupuncturist for a wonderful three years. And uh, I thought that acupuncture would be just a, you know, a screwdriver to go with my hammer or something like that, but it completely changed my worldview. It catalyzed a deep tra transformation inside of me. I changed my practice. I quit my psychoanalysis. I got a therapeutic divorce, and I was completely <laughs> initiated into the world of integrative medicine, and the sawdust went away. So I went on my journey looking for tools. I went to meditation, I went to shamanism, I went to the jungle in South America, I went to um, inflammation and dysbiosis education, I learned how to treat adrenal fatigue, I went uh, to programs with Janet to learn about uh, functional approaches. 
And um, as I developed this toolkit, I started to shift, um, like Janet did, my whole view about psychiatry. I wasn't just looking for tools to treat symptoms anymore. I was developing a different way of looking at um, what is going on for these folks that I was treating. And then when uh, I had a knock at the door about 10 years ago when perimenopause arrived at my house, and uh, <laughs> I, 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 was, uh, I thought I was just cruising along fine, practicing my holistic psychiatry, and then all of a sudden I had this stabbing pain. It was like one paring knife in each eye. If I would try to read for more than 10 minutes at night, it was completely unsustainable. So I saw all the doctors. None of the treatments worked. Finally, I found hormone replacement therapy. So, but I needed to know the science. I'm an engineer, I have an engineering background. I needed to know the science. I couldn't find anybody, so I thought, well, I'll just, you know. So when Will and I went to the HRT training program in 2009, I was really just wanting to treat myself. I didn't think I would be treating anyone else. I didn't get quite enough, so I went back for another program, and all of a sudden found myself completing a 10-module functional medicine fellowship, and my transformation was complete. <laughs> So we have been working together with our friend Scott Shannon in a study group for about 15 years, fine-tuning our approaches to integrative psychiatry, and we're so happy to present that to you tonight. Here's our model. We, people come in wanting help with their symptoms. They're in pain. So we meet them at the symptom management end of this model. And uh, we don't, of course, buy into the party line that symptom clusters represent diseases. We know that symptom clusters are downstream effects of of deeper root causes. Just like you see someone with irritable bowel syndrome, you don't think, oh, that's a disease. We see someone who comes in with insomnia and depressed mood and fatigue and brain fog. We're thinking, okay, they have a major depression phenotype, but they don't have that mythical disease called major depressive disorder. But as soon as we can jump out of symptom management up into the business end of this model, we want to work with them on physiologic and psychospiritual root causes. The thing that makes our model different from standard functional medicine is that we give equal, we spend equal time addressing these two categories of root causes, and that makes all the difference in terms of outcomes. We have learned and we acknowledge the, the central role of trauma in changing the nervous system and in a downstream way affecting every organ system in the body. So if we don't include the treatment of trauma and psychospiritual root causes, uh, the outcomes aren't nearly as good. Right. So we start with the symptom management, and we really make an effort to not um, over-medicate people because we don't want to numb people out to where they lose motivation and they lose steam in their personal journey of their soul's mission in, in this planet. So we're aiming for the window of tolerability, and we're building um, rapport with people. We're buying time so that we can actually look at root causes and we can treat those. Um, it's important to look at the healer's capacity for tolerating intensity. So Janet and I have both been through you know, the journey we shared with you professionally, but we've also had a personal journey with our own intensities and our own challenges. And I think um, the way that you as a healer approach your own uh, challenges in your life is really going to determine how much space you have in your heart for the intensity of the people who work with you. So let's look at some definitions of normal. So I think... It, you know, in this culture, in a materialistic culture, we tend to think that everyone's having a normal experience, but we aren't. And our experience is probably worse than their experience, right? So, and this is reinforced by advertising, especially direct advertising of antidepressants. Um, so it's important um, in the treatment of psychiatry from a functional perspective, I think, to have um, conversations with patients about what's realistic. You know, life is challenging, life is difficult. There are joys and there are wonders of life too, but not everyone's having a Pepsi commercial ad inside of their lifetime, so. So, conventional medicine and integrative medicine, everyone agrees that if we can't engage people in change behaviors, then the rest of everything that we're doing is a moot point, right? So this is our attempt to help you figure out uh, where people are stuck. In integrative healthcare, we're all midwives of transformation. And people get stuck in the birth canal of transformation. And this is our attempt to help you figure out where people are getting stuck. So, 
Uh, basically, this is a river running from the bottom to the top, a river that takes people into their growth process and their evolution and their transformation, and people can get stuck in a variety of places. When people get stuck over here on the right-hand side, they have too many symptoms. They're overwhelmed. They're hunkered down, and you can see that arrow going down to the bottom. They may be dissociated. They're shut down. These are people who need help with symptom reduction. Whether you use meds, you use supplements, you use mind-body tools, whether you use psychotherapy, you have to help these people to have fewer symptoms so that they can find the sweet spot here in the middle on the x-axis where they can engage, they can get engaged in their transformational process. The people, when they're stuck on the left, and there's no judgment here, we've all been stuck in all of these places. When we're stuck here on the left, people are over-medicated. They're too comfortable. They're complacent. They're passive. They're... And that might be because of psychiatric medications, but think of anything that people binge on and that will do fine. You know, people can be over-medicated on their TV or their food or their exercise or their work or whatever. Um, these are people who need more access to their feelings. So they need some, they might need some weaning, they might need some help coming down from their favorite numbing substances so that they can get to the sweet spot in the middle where they're engaged with their transformational process. And when people are stuck in the bottom here, in the not yet willing place, they need stories, they need role models, they need paradigms. That's why in my practice, I consider it part of informed consent to explain this paradigm to people. People will make different chain choices. People will make different choices about their medications or about their treatment plan if they understand that their symptoms have meaning and that the symptoms are part of a journey, just like my journey with the sawdust feeling it took me to a place that I needed to go and moves people into engagement and transformation. It's such a helpful story to tell people and it's so different from what they hear on the TV ads for the antidepressants, you know, where it looks fun and easy and clean and it's available for a low copay. Uh, you know, and then they list that list of side effects at the end in a fast voice, you know, all those hilarious side effects at the end. But what they, the side effect that we worry about that they don't say in those ads is that pharmaceutical numbing may cause you to put your own precious life journey on pause. Right. So we don't want to help contribute to that. So on, on this um, x-axis challenge and support, we, we want to emphasize that we consider love to be defined as the combination of support and challenge. Okay, and that's a little bit different from the cultural message people are getting where if you love somebody, you support them all the time and you never challenge them. And we also th believe that the maximum growth happens at the border between challenge and support. So that's this middle ground here of moving people down, helping people move down the river um, into engagement and transformation. We can't develop resiliency without challenge. Challenge is necessary. So we don't want to take that away. We want to add whatever's needed to keep people moving. Okay, so here's a smattering of uh, symptom management tools that we teach at the Psychiatry Masterclass. Um, we tend to go for the most, uh, the least toxic um, symptom management tools. And um, we try not to uh, use medications long-term or at high doses. You know, symptom management could include short-term doses of pharmaceuticals at lower doses. It could also include mind-body techniques, which are not listed here. So there's an epidemic of inflammation and an epidemic of sympathetic overdrive. We have a lot of activation symptoms that we deal with with people. So we're using things off of this list things that support GABA levels and things that inhibit, uh, that lower glutamate levels in the brain to help people with their overactivation. And we prescribe autonomic nervous system treatments the same as medications. These are very powerful tools that help people to uh, reduce their symptoms. Conventional medicine fails us by prescribing a pill for every ill. If we just prescribe uh, a supplement, even a supplement or a mind-body technique, uh, for every ill, that's not substantially different. So it's very important. That takes us to the next important arm of the model, which is the physiologic root causes. Now, all of you in the audience who practice functional medicine and at home um, know this list very well, and this is the same list of root causes that we uh, assess and treat in our psychiatric patients. Um, I think of this like a video game where if you get your physiology optimized, you can unlock deeper levels of the game. We can't predict what 
journeys people are going to take if they get their physiology optimized, but we can tell you which journeys they're not going to take if their physiology is out of whack. So as we get into talking a little more about trauma, we want to start off with some definitions. For our purposes, trauma is not an event. Trauma is a persistent pattern of dysregulation in the body. It's a pattern of dysregulation in the hypothalamic pituitary axis, it's dysregulation in the central nervous system, and dysregulation in the autonomic nervous system. I want to point out for the functional medicine people in the crowd that uh, this bottom study here, uh, C-reactive protein, uh, which is a general marker of inflammation in the body, elevated after 20 years of childhood maltreatment. It stays so, elevated for 20 years after childhood maltreatment. Yeah. Yes, for, for 20 years. So um, this, this part of our talk is beginning to close the gap between functional medicine and the new psychiatry, illustrating the point that long-term trauma in the body is mediated by inflammation and autonomic overdrive. Okay, so if you're treating uh, diseases of inflammation in adults, you're probably treating people with trauma. That's one of the take-homes we want you to have tonight. Now, um, speaking of childhood trauma, I want to tell you about what we think is one of the most important studies that's ever been done in medicine was the ACE study, so the Adverse Childhood Events Study. This was led by Vincent Folletti at Kaiser in the 1990s. How many people have heard of the ACE study? Does anybody know about it? Okay, great. So those of you who don't know about it, amazing um, results. So he took a 10-item questionnaire that takes about three minutes to administer. And the items on the questionnaire include all kinds of different adversity from di divorce to substance abuse to incarceration to violence in the home to abuse. And um, he, he tabulated the results and what he got was about two-thirds of Americans have at least one ACE in their history. So this doesn't start, you know, so the picture of what's normal starts to change if you look at it that way. And if you have two or more ACEs in your history, then you've got a 100% increased risk of autoimmune disease. So trauma is involved in causation of the diseases we're trying to treat in medicine. Now at the top, we have an interesting study of um, Marines where they tested inflammation in these guys before they went to combat, and then they checked to see who got uh, PTSD in combat. And the people who were inflamed before going to combat were the most likely to get PTSD during their deployment. So inflammation and trauma is a two-way street. Inflammation predisposes to trauma, and trauma causes inflammation. And we encourage you to do a deep dive and uh, look under the hood for your own trauma. You don't know what's under there until you look, and you certainly don't know what's under there for your patients until you look. Um, we teach this professionally, but we've also learned this material personally, dealing with our own high A scores. and. Physician lifespans are 20 years shorter than the American average. So if you're anything like us, you'll be more effective, live longer, and more fulfilled as a provider if you deal with your own ACEs. Right, which reminds me of another study that showed that if you have six or more ACEs, your lifespan is reduced by 20 years. So 20-year reduction for doctors, 20-year for six ACEs? Hmm. hmm. <laughs> Okay, so this study also um, showed an interesting connection between um, long-term inflammation and childhood abuse, a different angle on it. Uh, McGowan took uh, brain samples, post-mortem brain sampling from suicide completers, and what he found was that the density of cortisol receptors in the hippocampus, I'll walk you through this, um, was reduced in people who had had childhood abuse. So lifelong, all the way through to their death by suicide, they had less cortisol receptors in the hippocampus. The reason that's important is because those receptors are necessary to complete the negative feedback loop. So these folks with early childhood trauma were not able to get their cortisol levels down adequately because there was a, re a reduced density of receptors, which comes from uh, methylation of this gene, NR3C1. So again, um, making the point that we need to treat not just the physiologic causes, but also the psychospiritual causes of medical disease. 
And that brings us to the third arm of our model, which is addressing psychospiritual root causes. Remember that trauma is not an event, it's not a memory, but it's a pattern in the nervous system, and it's a, pa a pattern that changes the nervous system and trickles down to every organ system in the body. We disagree with the narrow definition of trauma that's, uh, that's uh, espoused in the DSM, which includes helplessness, events facing helplessness in the face of uh, life-threatening events. We think that the definition of trauma should be broadened to include what we call little t trauma, what's called commonly called little t trauma, which is relational trauma. It has to do with rejections and abandonments and humiliations. It has to do with not being seen and known, which are two fundamental human needs that follow closely behind food and water. Uh, Insecure attachment style is an important adaptation to relational trauma, and I'll talk about that again in a moment. And I'd like to share a, a quick uh, story of, of post-traumatic growth. Um, I had the good fortune to be a part of a, um, a, a research team um, studying MDMA psychotherapy for chronic treatment-resistant PTSD. And one of the participants in our study um, gave me permission to share this. As he was beginning to transcend and include his trauma uh, from deployment in the military, he received a, a kind of a, an image in his mind during an MDMA session where he, um, you know, that we were doing MDMA psychotherapy with him, where the image was um, of a beautifully carved um, piece of wood into, um, into the shape of a man. And he came to realize that this is how life works, is that you start off as a kind of a rough piece of wood or like a stump, and then you become carved by your experience of life. And he didn't regret that he had been to combat. He didn't regret anything that happened there. He was able to appreciate the wisdom and the deepening and the strength that he gained from everything he faced. So when people start to see the balance of the downsides with the benefits of the adversity that they face, you know that they're moving in the right direction. And they're remodeling their brains. Right. So we all have an enduring attachment style. And it's either a secure attachment style or it's an insecure attachment style. And you develop an in insecure attachment style as an adaptation to trauma in your earliest childhood caregiver relationships. People who have an insecure attachment style, and there are two examples of types, insecure attachment types listed here, those people can't tolerate the intimacy, the vulnerability, the collaboration, the dependency that's needed to have a successful healthcare relationship. So this is important in every healthcare relationship. It's a major obstacle to health and healing. Attachment style is like an unconscious computer program that's running in the background, controlling all of your relationships and controlling all of your beliefs about what's possible in life. And this is ridiculously prevalent. In one study, 88% of people with primary hypertension had insecure attachment styles. And if you look at chronic disease outcomes, those with insecure attachment styles had worse outcomes than those with secure attachment styles. So these are people in your practices. They may be sitting across from you smiling and nodding. They might not be smiling and nodding, but they might be smiling and nodding, but not getting, you can't get any traction with your treatment. This is something to be aware of and diagnose because this is a major obstacle to good outcomes in all integrative medical care and all conventional medical care. It's one way that trauma uh, reduces health, overall health, and reduces longevity. So this is the reason why we recommend that you become familiar with some specific psychotherapy treatments with trauma. And when you're building your team or you're building your referral network, that you include uh, referrals for trauma so that people can change their brains. This is not a death sentence when people have their reduced density of cortical cortisol receptors in the, in the brain. It's something that can be changed with treatment. And this is a sample of treatments that we've found to be effective. Exactly. And so insecure attachment patterns can, as Dan Siegel says, be reversed. And you can earn secure attachment is the term that he used. So attachment patterns are learned behaviors, and they can be changed. That's the good news. It's not personality. That's one of the take-home right. messages is the style that people have when they're, they're so uh, defensive or they're non-compliant or they're... Uh, resistant, you know, that's that's not a uh, personality, that's a learned adaptation to trauma. And we are 
wholeheartedly in, in favor of the movement toward um, integrative coaching. People need education, people need accountability. There's a huge value in that. But this is, a, is an entirely different animal that needs to be added on. If people have a trauma background, they need a psychotherapy that's specifically directed toward their trauma. So I'd like to share with you um, some pooled phase two data from the MDMA psychotherapy trials for chronic treatment resistant PTSD. Does everybody know what MDMA is? Has anybody heard of that? Okay. So MDMA is a chemical that causes um, a heart opening experience, um, decreases interpersonal fear, allows people to get in touch with trauma with much less um, defensiveness and fear. So. Um, this um, slides, these, this data is from um, a phase, end of phase two meeting with FDA. And I just want to walk you through this on the y-axis here. We have global CAPS. Mean the CAPS is the clinician administered PTSD scale. It's a scale that goes from zero to 136. Um, the people in phase two in these studies is an N of uh, 107. Started in the mid 80s, which is um, rather severe PTSD and 50 is the cutoff for the diagnosis of PTSD. So at 12 month follow up, the average was in the 30s. And people tended to improve um, as they went along toward the 12 month follow up. And these kind of results are unheard of, by the way. Yeah, this is a difficult condition to treat. There's a, a tremendous suffering and, and decades of, of symptoms for some people. So how does MDMA psychotherapy compare to Paxil and Zoloft, the FDA approved medications? Um, you can see here, that first of all, um, when you subtract out the placebo group, with Zoloft, you have a six point drop in the CAP scale. Um, on a scale of 136, a drop of six is not that much. And then 10 points for Paxil, and with MDMA, uh, 26. And then look at these dropout rates, and these are typical for SSRI um, research, 30 to 40% dropout rates because of side effects. And then you have a 7% dropout rate with MDMA. So these, um, this approach is now in phase three clinical trials, and um, it's probably gonna be a few more years before we see this um, you know, uh, up for approval with the FDA for general use. I've got two clickers in my pocket, so there's one of them's working. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So that brings us back to the model. Um, Conventional medicine and even functional medicine to some extent says that the earth is flat and this is a two-dimensional model. But we're here to tell you that the earth is round and this is a three-dimensional model. What I mean by that is that there is no separation between physiologic root causes and psychospiritual root causes. Each one is a, both a cause and an effect of the other. If you have psychospiritual trauma, which is nearly ubiqu ubiquitous, it will disrupt your physiology. And your, if your physiology is not optimized, it will block your psychospiritual journey. So this is not a stick figure anymore. It's a chalice. It's a 3D chalice of health. Nice. And this is a uh, more detailed version of the three arm model. Um, the point I want to make here is sharing, this is a, um, a tool that we use to teach the psychiatry masterclass. As James was saying, we need to go upstream. We need to look at the upstream effects. So in psychiatry, we look at all these um, inputs into psychiatric health, filtered down through personal history and traumas and epigenetic changes into these functional medicine pathways, unconscious beliefs. And down here, we have the outputs. So coping strategies and symptoms are simply outputs of dysregulation anywhere on the map. So any symptom can come from anywhere on the map, but we're gonna look for root causes because we're not just gonna medicate symptoms, which is what we were taught to do in our training down here. And that conventional psychiatry uses that whack-a-mole approach with just the symptoms at the bottom, right. labels and whack-a-mole, and it loses yeah. the whole upstream activity. Exactly. Yeah. Our 10-year vision is medicine and psychiatry united together with a common vision that puts trauma and stress at the core of all levels of human health. So let's do this, people. Is anybody up for this? <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. So one way to jump in is to find yourself on this model. Find yourself personally. Find yourself professionally. Where are you stuck? And for that matter, take all of us as a community and put us on this model. Where are we stuck in the birth canal of transforming medicine 
for the future. Most in individual practitioners are stuck over here on the right. They're, they're, having, they're overwhelmed, they're overworked, they have their heads down, they can't figure out when or how they're ever gonna change their practices. And our message is that community is the antidote. The way to move out of the yellow on the right and up into the green is community. We've benefited so much from the community that we've had with other psychiatrists in our holistic psychiatry study group and with each other, with Scott, Shannon, and Will and I and others. And uh, that's part of why we decided to come and present to you together as a community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're really grateful, James, to be a part of this new community. Thank you. Yes. So if you'd like to learn more, if you'd like to hear about our programs, this is where you can find us. Um, Psychiatry Masterclass is where psychiatrists come to learn functional medicine and where functional medicine doctors come to learn psychiatry. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, wasn't that great? We'll have a big, big round of applause for, for Will and Janet. They'll be back here in the panel later. Thank you for coming through the technical glitches with us. There may not be music, but that was so awesome. I asked the, uh, I asked the photographer, I said, look, we like to get these memes, right, where there's the, the head and then there's some space on the side so we can put the best stuff that they said, put it in a meme and put it on Facebook and Instagram, whatever. That was, I don't know what we're gonna choose, chock full. And, the, and Twitter is agreeing with me because people are tweeting the, you know, the stuff that you're saying. I think that was really, uh, really fantastic. So what a great start to the evening. Um, really excited to, uh, to share a little bit more here as, as we move forward. So, um, you know, I, uh, one of the things that we have, uh, and, and a great point at the end is that uh, a phrase that I've used a lot throughout is a Thich Nhat Hanh quote where he says, community is the guru of the future. And, you know, you're seeing that in psychiatry. You're definitely going to see it next month in cardiology. Uh, we're going to be talking about a community-based program that has 4,000 people that have all come together to help them, you know, reverse and prevent uh, heart issues. So it's it's true more and more. So I want to welcome to the stage another psychiatrist. You know, we have... Uh, we have um, we came up with this idea last year called the future of functional in five and part of it was because there's literally only like five speakers per event we do 12 events a year but I know there is so much wisdom in the grander community that has not had a chance to speak. Like I try and find the best people. You know, this year we're really focusing, you saw last month, this month, and next month, focusing on providers that, can, that have a course that people can take so that we can scale this up. Like you're not gonna learn everything you need to learn from integrative psychiatry from a 20 minute talk at the Functional Forum. We need scale. We need like hundreds and thousands of psychiatrists trained in this manner. So you will see the people that we're speaking and choosing to speak have trainings that can scale this up. And so one of the things that we came up with was this idea called the future of functional in five. Everyone has so many amazing ideas about how we can transform functional medicine. So I would love for you to welcome to the stage for a future live future of functional in uh, five. She is a psychiatrist also from uh, Denver. She's going to be talking about innovate, innovation in psychiatry. Please welcome Dr. Chanel Heerman. Thank you, James. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, tonight, I'd like to talk about my two favorite topics, which are women's mental health and telemedicine. And for me, these are actually the same topic, so I will explain. Um, first of all, women in our society are stressed. We actually do about twice as much domestic work as men do, including both housework and childcare. And it adds up to a whole extra shift, an extra month per year due to this second shift. Um, more relevant to our, our patient population here, women do 25% less exercise and recreation than men do. So the very lifestyle changes we're trying to get women to incorporate into their lives, they don't have time to do. And because of all these stressors, along with other factors, women are twice as likely to suffer from the most common mental illnesses, being both depression and anxiety disorders. And so what can we do about this? Obviously there are big societal issues, we'll keep working on those, but as doctors, what can we do right now? I think it makes sense to start with moms because they tend to be the hardest hit, and I think it really makes sense to start with new moms. Um, we've, we've found that 15% of new moms suffer from postpartum depression, which is about over half a million American women. 
So Dr. Settle and I just recently put out an article in the Psychiatric Times on the evidence-based treatment for integrative treatments for perinatal depression. And what we found was that there's really good evidence actually for exercise, for yoga, and for group models. Um, there's decent evidence for omega-3 fatty acids and massage, and a whole emerging evidence base for a whole bunch of other techniques. I'd encourage you to go check it out online for free because tonight we are not gonna focus on what we can offer to these moms, but I wanna talk about how we can offer it. So imagine that you're a new mom who finally decided to go get some help for your postpartum depression. And first you have to bundle the baby up and go out in the cold, especially here in Colorado. Um, you have to find someplace else to take your toddler or your preschool or maybe get grandma to watch them, get a babysitter or drag them all to the office with you. Um, then you drive across town, find parking, juggle that huge baby carrier across the icy parking lot so you can be in a crowded waiting room with your toddler who needs a nap and your baby who's probably hungry and a whole dozens of people who are just waiting to share their germs with your brand new baby. And the trouble with this is now trying to get help for your stress is becoming a stressor in itself. So imagine not having to do this. Imagine just logging into an easy to use app on your phone or your computer, settling into your own comfy couch, maybe grab a cup of tea, cuddle your baby. You can feed in comfort and privacy whenever you want. You can manage your older children with the, their toys in their house. And you still get the benefit of a real doctor who really cares about you and feels like they're right there in the room with you. So now you can get some help without creating additional stress. Um, for the doctor, there are actually benefits clinically. You can see how the mom is interacting with her new baby. You can see how she interacts with her other kids. You can even sometimes see how she interacts with her partner or her spouse. And you can see what the house looks like. It's actually like an old fashioned house call just updated for the 21st century. <laughs> In fact, there are some groups like uh, Naya Care here in Colorado that actually does home visits for postpartum moms, and they now have access to specialists like me on demand over telemedicine right there in their houses. Um, there are also a lot of benefits for us personally as physicians. Um, you can actually start to get the life balance that you're trying to model for your patients. So. Um, you can make effective use of your time. If you have a no-show, you can do projects on your own computer at your house or throw in a load of laundry if you want to. Um, if other stuff goes wrong in your life, there's a snow day or you've got a minor cold, if you can make it down the hall, clinic is on. And if you happen to be a mom doc, you can say goodbye to mommy guilt for those sick days where you have to try and decide between your patients and your kiddos. Just get them a babysitter and pop out for a story and a cuddle in between patients. Um, I also find it really helpful for when loved ones really need you. So you've got a seriously ill family member who needs some help, or your best friend just had a new baby. You can actually literally be there for them because you practice over telemedicine. Um, for me personally, there isn't much I would trade for that level of connection and peace of mind that telemedicine has created for me. Um, the biggest question I usually get about it is, does it feel like a real relationship? Is this somehow substandard or not as good as in-person care? And so I wanted to show you something. This is my little stuffed doggy, and this is my pretty bracelet. These were gifts that I got from the public mental health clinic that I used to work at from patients there. So these were low-income women who didn't have a lot of disposable money and decided that I mattered enough to them that they wanted to say goodbye with a present. And they mattered to me, and I mattered to them, and yet we had never set foot in the same room together. So what telemedicine does is it creates real relationships that support real people who just happen to have a little screen between them, and I think that benefits everyone. So I'm happy to answer questions afterwards or on the um, Practice Accelerator Forum on Facebook. And thank you so much, James, for this opportunity. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so really excited that we got to, to focus on, on the delivery of the care, right? One of the things that became really clear to us last year, that the Institute for Functional Medicine did their first survey and showed that the biggest thing that was holding back functional medicine from becoming the standard of care was just a really obvious inefficiency, right? An hour and a half intake is awesome, and we love the fact that we can spend that time with patients, but... 
how many people can you really see if you have that kind of system? And so what we've looked to do uh, at the Evolution of Medicine, the first thing that we wanted to do with the Functional Forum is make this kind of information accessible to everyone. You didn't have to go to a conference um, and pay to go there and fly there. You could watch the Functional Forum online forever for free. And then the second thing we saw is, okay, now that we've opened up the barriers, there are still so many practitioners who want to practice functional medicine, but just can't work out the model how to do it. And so we started this thing called the, uh, the practice accelerator and um, I wanted to we, we're gonna have a, a bit of a new segment we typically would do the practice transformation tools but I just wanted to show some notes from the practice accelerator uh, here because I feel like um, you know it's very important for us to uh, to look at the models and we've already heard two amazing things that we teach in the practice accelerator one is the provider teams Scott Shannon these guys working with uh, these teams together so that you can have maybe the naturopathic doctor can do the intake you know it doesn't have to be what kind of physician can you know all the teams can work together the other thing is telemedicine and we talk about that here but um, so this is the accelerator uh, it's uh, goevomed.com slash accelerator to find out more about it. We created it to help practices really work out how to practice functional medicine and learn from, you know, we're in a very unique position here at the Functional Forum is that we're hearing from the whole industry. You know, if you're a physician practicing by yourself, you have an idea of what you're doing and maybe a few other people that you meet, but you don't know what the best practices are coming from across the industry. And so what we did is boil down those best practices. So, you know, we t we've talked already about, you know, provider teams, telemedicine, two really obvious ones, but I wanted to talk about one thing that I think is the core central part of the, um, of the evolution of medicine and particularly uh, patient education, right? So much patient education in the first era of this medicine was done face-to-face, -face, right? Doctor to patient face-to-face, -face, which is awesome, super engaging, but ridiculously inefficient. And there's so many ways that we can do that now. So the email autoresponder sits at the middle of the practice accelerator and every efficient practice is delivering information via this kind of service and not via one-on-one -on -one doctor to patient. So a couple of examples. So an email autoresponder, if, you, if you're not aware of the terminology, is just when something happens, like you put in your email into uh, a box and say, I want to get an email, you get a series of emails that come the same for every person that puts in their, their details. And so the reason why it's really valuable is one, you can set it and forget it. At this moment in functional medicine, we are in the world of physician entrepreneurship and being a mum and being a doctor and being an entrepreneur is really hard. You know, we talked about being two, but being three is harder than anything. And so once you set it up and you set up the autoresponder, you know, you can forget it. Every person is gonna get the same predictable stream. Two, you can tell your story perfectly every time. How amazing would it be to visit one of these guys' clinics here and to hear from them that they're not the hoity-toity psychiatrist that is just telling you what to do, but people who have actually been there, right? To have a real sense of empathy to really be able to put yourself in those shoes. You want to tell that story consistently every time without it taking up any of your time. And you can do that on you know, the email autoresponder. Two, you can add so much value before the first appointment. Some of the most innovative clinics that we're seeing now in their autoresponders will tell you how to avoid coming into their clinic. Because what they can say is if the whole goal is to empower you not to have to need care. Right, the goal of functional medicine is to, is to create an empowered patient who's well and doesn't need any more medical care. Right, so if you can deliver some of that learning through an automated system that takes none of your time, there's no downside to that. All the clinics that are doing that are thriving because they are delivering way more value before they ever have an appointment. It's easily shared, I'll share this in a minute, but we've had so many examples of people, you send out an email, everyone knows how to use email. Even my 80-year-old dad in South Africa, who's watching right now, hi dad, actually it's two in the morning, so he's probably watching tomorrow. Um, but yeah, like he knows how to use email and he knows how to do forward, and if he sees something interesting coming, he might send it to all of his friends. So now you're building in marketing into a structure that was really designed for patient education. And for it saves you time every day after it's set up. And time is the one thing that we can't make more of. We have to get more efficient with it. There is real value in the time that's spent with patients. So all this other time on the education that's needed, let's do it in a more efficient way. People have done handouts. People have done group orientations. It is a really efficient way to deliver uh, information. And if there is an educational component to make the most out of your practice, you need to deliver it in a scaled way. 
So these are just some of the lessons. These are some of the practitioners who are actually writing about their experience. This is uh, from naturopathic doctor, um, Dr. Michelle. She says, shout out to all those working on the accelerator. She worked up a series of 42 emails. She came up with a series of what is everything that I will want every patient to know about how to keep themselves healthy. 43 daily emails. That's a lot of emails. She didn't think anyone would sign up. 42 people signed up. She's got five meet and greet scheduled. So in that autoresponder, you put a link to book an appointment, right? In almost all of them. Say, hey, if you're ready to go, time to book an appointment, and they could book an appointment. One thing that I learned from ZocDoc is that 80% of people who want to book an appointment online do so between the hours of 6 p.m. and 9 a.m. There's no one in your practice then. There's no one picking up the phone. And, you know, they have a pain at that moment, and they want to be able to book. Online booking is absolutely crucial, especially if you're doing a telemedicine practice. Um, this week on the Evolution of Medicine podcast, it comes out on Thursday or Friday, we're featuring uh, two ladies, Marjorie Nass and Heather Campbell. They've started a program called Ready, Set, Recover. And Ready, Set, Recover is a program that you as a practitioner can recommend to people who are going through surgery. They took all the things that they knew about how to have people recover efficiently from surgery and put it in dun dun dun, email autoresponder. And it's a product. And you as a practitioner can curate it. And if you're a patient listening at home, you can gift it to someone who's having a, a surgery and it's got information for pre-surgery, during surgery and after surgery. So this is an example of what it can do. And I think that we need to, if we want to educate people at scale, we need to take advantage of the technologies that can be, uh, can be used. So a couple of shout outs from the, from the accelerator. David Gordon's here in the house. What are they? Let's have a round of applause for any man who would write this. Proud to be making the change and on the forefront of the future of healthcare. This is a doctor that left a very predictable practice to be able to build, a, uh, to build his new practice. He says, the community and support here has been phenomenal. If you're going to make a transformational change, of which switching to do functional medicine is a transformational change, you need the support of a community. And that's what we're creating here at the Evolution of Medicine to allow 100,000 physicians to come and build these type of practices. So thanks, David, for stepping out. I know it's not always easy. Um, to be the first, but uh, you know it takes a lot of courage. Um, Dr. Kieran Cow, she's in uh, in uh, North Carolina. Same kind of thing. Needed a community to be able to take the leap to build this low overhead micro practice, and we're really proud to have all of them in our community. And also in the accelerator, we teach people how to use technology and the technologies that can help them run a more efficient practice. And just think Nudge here, Nudge Coach is a really awesome technology to help you track what your patients are doing between appointments and nudge them if they're doing the wrong thing. See, it's a clever name. Oh, you haven't eaten it, you know, you're not taking the picture of your food, you're meant to be in, con in connection about your food, and particularly for the functional nutritionists and, and uh, health coaches out there, if you're the one whose job is behavior change, then it would be nice, wouldn't it, to know exactly what your patients are doing between appointments, and Nudge allows you to do that. So in the, in the Practice Accelerator, we actually help practitioners operationalize these types of technologies so that you can make the most benefit in your practice. So this is a new segment, um, Notes from the Accelerator. I just, you know, we've been doing this now for a few months and uh, I just wanted to have an opportunity to wrap with all of you here because I feel like this is the big blockage now. There is literally an epidemic of doctors that have taken functional medicine trainings but are still working their jobs in emergency room medicine in these other doctors because they can't work out a way to deliver the practice. And the good news is you don't need so much stuff as you need. We have practices popping up off a laptop in a non-traditional medical environment, like a co-working space, a corporate campus, a CrossFit. Um, you know, in, the, in two functional forums time, we're going to be at Lifetime Fitness in Minneapolis. They've got 137 gyms. They want to put functional medicine in all of them. Health is happening where people actually are, and we're facilitating it. All right. Next up, I want to introduce um, my good friend, Dr. Isabella Wentz, who's going to come up. Now, back in, we got sound. We got sound, yes. Just a second here, Isabella. So back in September, we did a show called Introducing Functional Medicine 2.0. Terry Walls is amazing. If you didn't see that talk, it's like the best one we've ever had. Jeff Glad is the man. And Tom O'Brien gave us a preview of his thing, Betrayal. Did anyone check out Betrayal? I cried in it. You might have seen it. Um, anyway, uh, I went to South Africa. Uh, in December, my dad lives there, and everyone knew about betrayal. I mean, I was speaking to a group of functional practitioners, but the ability, you know, the big thing about functional medicine 2.0 is that there are people out there who are building the, you know, the information like 
like Betrayal to be able to get the word out to millions of patients at the same time about the potential of functional medicine. So I just want to give an intro to something that's coming up that I think is going to do the same for thyroid disease as he did for autoimmune disease. Check it out. This is thyroid disease. It's what I believe may be the single greatest life-destroying pandemic of our time. In the U.S. alone, it's affecting 28% of the population. That's almost one in three people. We're staring in the face of a disease which is lying dormant, which will raise its ugly head and begin devouring the things that matter most to us in this world. What's most upsetting is that people are told that it's a disease they can never recover from, and that your condition will gradually worsen. And you may hear that your body will never be the same again. It'll never work the way it used to. I'm Dr. Isabella Wentz. I'm a trained doctor of pharmacy, yet I had no idea what was happening to me. Eventually, I discovered that I had hypothyroidism, which had developed into the autoimmune disease Hashimoto's. My life was nearly destroyed. I researched the science, the case studies, the discoveries doctors had made, and what I'm about to share with you is that you can reverse your thyroid condition. All right, so please keep the questions coming on Twitter. We're gonna have a panel in a minute. Please welcome Boulder, uh, Bol not native, but Bol currently Boulder citizen, Dr. Isabella Wentz. So, I have a confession to make. I haven't always been interested in the thyroid gland, especially not during pharmacy school. I thought that thyroid disease was just something that everybody got once they got older. And quite frankly, at the pharmacy when I was dispensing tons of thyroid hormones, I never quite understood why people kept complaining about symptoms when they were already taking medications. It wasn't until I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis in 2009, after almost a decade of some pretty debilitating symptoms. So today I'm gonna to share with you a little bit more about thyroid disease and how we can address it, as well as how it can masquerade as mental illness. So, I'm 18 years old. I am a coming out of my freshman year in college, and I go home for the summer. I'm a little bit beat down and a little bit depressed. And one of the reasons was because I missed my final exam in chemistry. Now, this probably wasn't that unusual that a college student would miss a final exam, except for me, that was really unusual because I was, you know, a straight A student. I was a very type A person and I got my stuff done, right? Yet, um, I missed my 9 a.m. exam. And the other part of it was that I just laid down to take a nap at 3 p.m. the day before. And so, what was at the root cause of my fatigue, right? I go home for the summer with my tail between my legs. I'm going back to the Chicago suburbs where I'm from. And my parents just didn't say the same Isabella again. They said, wow, you know, you don't really care about much of the things you used to care about. You are sleeping all the time. You are, you know, you're forgetting stuff. What's going on with you? And so as any loving parents would do, they sent me to a psychiatrist, right? And I was diagnosed with um, severe depression very severe depression, like they were concerned about me and they were, um, you know, they, they wanted to put me on suicide watch because they were so concerned with what was going on with me. Now, going back to my health history and my health timeline, what was going on before I got sick, right? Before I started having all these symptoms. And of course, um, you know, I, th I think I had a couple of boyfriends break up with me, so that always happens in college. and. I, I missed an exam and that was very, very hard for me. But I also had the Epstein-Barr virus or mono. And that is a known trigger for thyroid disease. And that set me on a path of misdiagnosis for almost a decade. I was misdiagnosed with panic attacks. 
I was misdiagnosed with anxiety. I was misdiagnosed with major depressive disorder. And this is what happens to people for, with thyroid disease. They're told that they're either crazy, <laughs> perhaps that they're lazy, like, like I was because I was sleeping all the time. And sometimes they're just told that they're fat, right? Because they can't seem to pull off the weight no matter what they do. And so um, many times some of the root causes of thyroid disease may actually be some of the root causes of mental health illness and mental health symptoms may actually be due to thyroid disease. When we um, are all taught in schools, you know, if nursing school, pharmacy school, medical school, we get this picture of a woman, right? Um, this is probably like something you've seen in a textbook before where half of her is hypothyroid and the other half is hyperthyroid. And so you have this woman that is dealing with symptoms and one half of it is, you know, hypothyroid. So you've got the sluggish metabolism, you've got the hair loss, you've got the brain fog, and you've got the weight gain, right? And then on the other half, you have somebody who's hyperthyroid. So you've got palpitations, you've got panic attacks, anxiety disorders, the bulging eyes, and, you know, just overall, like, speeding up of things. But the truth is, usually, this is an advanced stage for people. And... Um, most people who have Hashimoto's, which is what I had, might have symptoms from both sides. So I not only had a sluggish brain, but I also had anxiety. Not, I not only had um, weight loss, that was actually my symptom, but I also had the brain fog and I also had the cold intolerance. And it was, you know, missed for many, many years. So I kept getting the same kind of runaround. So, you know, I think it's in your head. Maybe you need antidepressants. Maybe you need anti-anxiety medications. Um, I think you're just getting older. I was 25 at the time, so. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and this is the message that most people get. Now, when I first got diagnosed um, with Hashimoto's, it was 2009, and my symptoms started in 2000. This is um, my loving husband, Michael, who's been with me, supporting me all along the way. And when I first got home from getting my diagnosis, I go, I have Hashimoto's. And Michael said, that sounds like an exotic Japanese sword fighter. Like, what's going on, right? But this condition, this autoimmune condition that happens to impact the thyroid gland is actually quite qu common. So studies have shown that up to 27% of our population actually has Hashimoto's when using advanced diagnostic methods. Now, during those nine years, when I struggled to get a diagnosis, I would go, um, every year I was a good girl, and I was like um, very concerned about my health. I was a pharmacy student, and you know, I thought I had every condition, right? Because that's what you do when you're going through school. But I kept getting the same tests done, and all of them were normal. One of the reasons is that the TSH test is not going to be elevated until somebody's had thyroid disease for quite some time. The other, the other reason, of course, was that... Um, the interpretation of the test was lacking back in the day. So we now know that most people feel best with a TSH between 0.5 and 2. And mine was 4.5, and I have this wonderful report that says your thyroid is normal, yet I was sleeping for 12 hours a night, right? And I was, I, you know, I used to call myself, those were my sloth days, right? Um, and we also know that this condition impacts five to eight women for every one man that's impacted, and, and I, ha I have a theory about this. It's my safety theory of, of autoimmune thyroid disease because quite frankly, it's not safe to be a woman in our, in our world. Um, as you know, the doctors were talking about, when you have a history of trauma and you have this, this is a potential root cause of thyroid disease, these are things that are gonna set you on a cascade of ab abnormal thyroid hormone levels later on in life. The other thing to consider is that most people who are seeking your care are likely to have um, the, you know, the general population statistics are 27% when you use advanced diagnostic methods like thyroid antibodies or, um, or using a fine needle aspiration biopsy to diagnose Hashimoto's. But the truth is that many of the people presenting to healthcare professionals and trying to get healthcare services that percentage of thyroid disease is gonna be much higher in them. 
Um, and one of my um, one of my friends, Trudy Scott, she's a nut wonderful functional nutritionist, and she specializes in anxiety. And she says that anywhere from 50 to 60 percent of her clients with anxiety actually have thyroid antibodies. So one important thing to note with Hashimoto's is that it's not like black and white. It's not like you just have it full blown or, or you don't have it. There's actually five stages to Hashimoto's. In the first stage, um, for all intents and purposes, your thyroid function is normal, your immune system function is normal, and you're not gonna have any symptoms, right? This is just the genetic predisposition. The second stage is when things start to change. So we start seeing an infiltration of white blood cells right into the thyroid gland. And people can start seeing changes by, in thyroid antibodies. So you might see thyroglobulin antibodies or thyroid peroxidase antibodies in this stage, but the TSH will still be normal. The other interesting thing is there's also seronegative Hashimoto's. So some people don't even have thyroid antibodies and doing a thyroid ultrasound or um, you know, a biopsy might be another way to find thyroid disease. But really, unless you biopsy every single cell within the thyroid gland, you can't tell if there's white blood cells in there. So um, it's really not something you can necessarily exclude by doing thyroid antibody tests. The other thing is, in this stage, there's just beginning attack of the thyroid gland, so the thyroid tissue may still be intact, but the body's already compensating. And this is when we start seeing symptoms. So people in this stage are gonna have the panic attacks. Um, one of the, there's multiple studies on the different types of symptoms that are correlated in this stage, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic attacks, anxiety. Um, one of my favorite one was health seeking behavior, <laughs> hypochondria, right? And a lot of times, and um, traveling the country the last year or so, I've interviewed over um, 60 patients with thyroid disease. And through my um, platform, The Thyroid Pharmacist, I have over 300,000 people that follow me online, my clients and whatnot, and they all share the same stories with me, is like, they were going to get care. They were trying to seek the help, but people were just telling them that there was, you know, you're crazy, here's an antidepressant. There's, you know, you're, you're just fat, you have fork and mouth disease, you need to eat less. Um, yeah, these are true stories, right? And then that's stage two. Now, if you can get a person diagnosed in this stage, you can prevent a lifetime of fork to mouth disease. You can prevent a lifetime of depression. And you can also prevent the need for thyroid hormones or thyroid medications because you can, you know, while we have some technologies that can reverse and accelerate tissue healing, it's much easier to prevent damage on a thyroid gland than it is to like regrow new tissue. Stage three is when um, more progressive doctors are starting to diagnose people where a person will have subclinical hypothyroidism and they will also have um, slightly elevated TSH and then they will have you know, the thyroid antibodies or not. And at this point, we start seeing more and more symptoms. Um, we know that treating people with thyroid hormones at this stage can also be helpful. Um, for pregnant women, this is usually a must, but for in the conventional world, whenever a woman who's not pregnant comes in with a TSH, I don't know, six, seven, or eight, she's told to wait and watch. To wait and watch for what, right? For, <laughs> for it to get worse? And so stage four is um, overt hypothyroidism. This is when most people get diagnosed, right? And at this point, they are prescribed a medication. Um, I think we all know the brand name levothyroxine. It was the number one prescribed drug in two out of the last three years. It finally got beat out by Vicodin last year, right? And this is something that they're getting, but many of them continue to have symptoms with this medication. And they're told, oh, well, your thyroid's got nothing to do with your hair loss, your thyroid's got nothing to do with your weight gain, and your thyroid has nothing to do with your depression. And um, the scariest part is that this medication is not only, it doesn't really help the symptoms that it's supposed to treat, but it also doesn't stop the progression of the condition. So we know that um, Hashimoto's, like every autoimmune condition, is progressive. And so stage five, is when we start seeing progression to other types of autoimmune conditions. I've talked to so many people around the world who, who were good girls. They took their thyroid medications. They did everything their doctors said. And then they were diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis 
or lupus or another type of autoimmune condition because the root cause, the trigger was still there. Nobody was doing anything about it. And so just a quick summary. So people have thyroids, people have symptoms. And a lot of times they're misdiagnosed with mental health issues when they have thyroid antibodies. And this is gonna be as, you know, you might not see the, any changes on the TSH. You might just see these changes when you do thyroid antibody tests. And so these are some of the antibodies to do for thyroid peroxidase, thyroid globulin, um, TSI, and, and TSH receptor antibodies. But, so um, going over a lot of the symptoms we talked about some of the symptoms that can be caused. And traditionally, people associated hypothyroidism with many of these symptoms, with, some of, with one set of symptoms and hyperthyroidism with another set of symptoms. But the truth is, when you have Hashimoto's, what's happening is as the body starts to attack the thyroid gland, we start seeing a big rush of thyroid hormones into the bloodstream. And this actually causes a transient hyperthyroidism. And so you will have a person who has symptoms of both an overactive and an underactive thyroid. And I can tell you personally, it's, not, it's no picnic, right? Um, so you end up with having um, anxiety and panic attacks on one hand, and then you end up, um, once the hormone gets cleared out of your body, you might have depression, fatigue, apathy. Um, there's a whole bunch of different conditions that can be traced back to thyroid disease. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that thyroid disease causes every single mental health symptom and condition. Of course, that would be ridiculous. But there's a significant percentage of people who have, you know, postpartum, thy postpartum thyroiditis, and that presents as postpartum depression. Or they have depression that can actually be resolved when treating the thyroid gland. Bipolar disorder, there's a big percentage of people with bipolar disorder who actually have thyroid antibodies. Um, I don't think this is really appreciated. People don't realize the effect of thyroid antibodies on the brain, um, except for in the case of Hashimoto's encephalopathy. But, you know, of course, this is a very extreme case. Um, as far as psychotropic medications go, Oftentimes, you know, I'll see, when I, when I used to work at the pharmacy, it was like, okay, here's your birth control, your antidepressant, and your thyroid med. It was just pretty much, we had this like fast mover section in the pharmacy that was like right up front, all the medications we commonly use. And that was just like, okay, they're all right here. I can just pull them all real quickly. Here we go, right? Um, because commonly women will be pr placed on all these different medications. And a lot of times they may actually, um, they may actually exacerbate some of the symptoms or even mask the condition. So um, medications that affect dopamine um, can actually suppress TSH. And so if a person was to go, was on, um, let's say, well, Butrin, and if they were going to get their TSH tested, it may be falsely suppressed. So you might miss a, thy a thyroid condition then. Um, we know with lithium, lithium has um, unfortunate and very unfortunate relationship with the thyroid gland and that's one of the really big things when you have a person on a lithium as pharmacists we were always taught to monitor their thyroid function because lithium can actually bring new onset thyroid disease or can exacerbate existing thyroid disease antipsychotic medications um so I used to be a before I became the thyroid pharmacist I was a consultant pharmacist um, in mental health and one of my biggest jobs and was actually to get people off of antipsychotic drugs because of the harmful metabolic effects they had. Um, and I can't get this statistic anywhere, but there was somebody that said that, you know, eat, like taking an antipsychotic drug is like eating three extra cheeseburgers a day, right? Um, because of their impact on the metabolism. Now, if you give somebody a highly sedating medication that makes them gain weight and they already have thyroid disease, like you're really not doing them much of a service. And of course, benzos and SSRIs, these are commonly given to people with thyroid disease and they really don't help in many cases. So studies have shown, like the STAR-D trial, that these medications are not super effective and especially if you have a thyroid condition, they're not gonna be all that effective as well. So what are the helpful interventions for people with thyroid disease? Well, obviously thyroid hormones, right? And so, um, you know, in pharmacology we call T4 and, and medications that need to be activated into the body, into other medications as prodrugs. And so T4, which is levothyroxine, the most commonly prescribed drug, is 
actually a prodrug. So it needs to be turned into, um, it needs to be activated in the body to work properly. And T3 is the more active version. And we see that people oftentimes will continue to struggle with thyroid symptoms when they're on this medication. So one you know, kind of crazy thing you can do is you can actually give them T3 directly. And that helps, that really helps some people resolve their symptoms. So people will say, wow, you know, like I started taking this medication, whether it's T3 directly in addition to the T4 or natural desiccated thyroid, but they'll say, wow, like I am not changing up my exercise routine, but I'm losing more weight and I feel better and my hair's growing back and my, my skin's nicer and I'm not as tired anymore. Of course, it doesn't stop there. Um, selenium supplements. So selenium supplement can be very, very helpful for people with thyroid disease. Selenium deficiency has been identified as um, a big potential uh, root cause of thyroid disease. And anywhere from 200 to 400 micrograms of selenium methionine has been shown to reduce thyroid antibodies by about half over the course of three months. The other cool thing that happens is a lot of times people's anxiety goes away or reduces when they have Hashimoto's and their antibodies start reducing. So this is something that can be very helpful and it's also helpful for, for postpartum thyroiditis. It's helpful for, um, for Graves' disease as well. Um, myo inositol is also a helpful intervention for a person who has um, you know, OCD-like symptoms as well as thyroid disease. The, they can go hand in hand. Um, there was one study done a little while ago that showed using myo inositol in combination with selenium helped to reduce not just thyroid antibodies, which actually helped to put some people on their remission range, but also helped to reduce TSH. And um, I did a survey of my readers in 2015, and I asked them about some of the most helpful interventions. And I broke it down into all kinds of classes and you know what helped most for what. And these were the actual interventions that people thought were most helpful for their mood-related symptoms with thyroid disease. And so balancing blood sugar. Wow, can you see some miracles when somebody eats blood sugar stable meals, right? Um, Gluten-free or paleo diet. Uh, my mom just sent me an article the other day and it was like, people are on the gluten-free diet when they shouldn't be. Like this, this crazy woman said she's on it for Hashimoto's. And I was like fuming in my little shoes because um, in my survey over 2000 readers and just in my work with clients, 88% of them feel better gluten-free when they have Hashimoto's. And um, what's crazy is in asking them which interventions helped most and least, and I have, you know, I don't have time to go through all these stats with you guys, but the, the gluten-free diet was actually more helpful for, for mood, for weight, as well as for energy, which are the top three thyroid symptoms people experience compared to thyroid medications. It's like, wow, um, paleo diet can be very, very helpful as well. And then auto, autoimmune paleo diet is another really helpful intervention where we see nodules shrinking when we see people you know, getting, like becoming brand new people when they, when they change their nutrition. Um, acupuncture, sauna therapy, massage therapy, and adrenal adaptogens, these are some of the other things that people say, you know, this really helped my mood with thyroid disease. And so I always like to think about root causes. So sometimes, you know, mood alterations can be caused by thyroid disease, right? But then what causes thyroid disease? And I like to look at the functional medicine approach, of course, when we look at food sensitivities. So gluten, dairy, and soy are the top reactive foods for people with thyroid conditions. Um, nutrient depletions, selenium, thiamine, magnesium, ferritin, as well as vitamin D are some of the common nutrient deficiencies. Um, chronic infections, Epstein-Barr virus, H. pylori, um, blastocystis hominis, various kinds of parasites, SIBO, all of these things can actually trigger thyroid disease. And in some cases, when you get a person treated for these, the person can go into remission. It's, it's amazing. It's like, well, I don't, this was the cause, right? Um, of course, um, impaired stress response. So there's a huge connection. And I think, you know, as everybody in this room is aware, to traumatic events and causing chronic illness. And thyroid disease is no different. Um, things like social rejection can actually bring on thyroid disease. There's a study of two, <laughs> of this like little rat study that was done in, um, 
there was a little rat family, mama and papa rat in their little home with their little rat children. And scientists decided to drop an intruder rat like right in that cage and see what happened, right? And of course the intruder rat immediately got attacked by papa rat and, got, um, and was defeated. And then that didn't feel very, very pleasant for, for the um, intruder rat. And so they decided to measure that rat's thyroid hormones right after, and guess what? They were altered, right? Um, you know, prisoners of war have altered thyroid hormone profiles. And, you know, it's anywhere from the extreme. It could be like from a mean girl's experience in high school, or it can be from something as extreme as having trauma, um, serious, very, very serious significant trauma in your life. Um, of course, intestinal permeability is a common uh, root cause. So that's something that's huge. Thyroid cells are actually made from the same fetal origins as gut cells are. And a lot of times we'll see when we address gut symptoms, we see thyroid symptoms improve. And then toxins, like really simple things like getting a fluoride filter can be super, really, really helpful for people and getting them to stop using their antibacterial soaps. So triclosan was recently banned by the FDA for having a thyroid hormone disruption. And I think about, you know, poor people with like OCD and using all of their <laughs> antibacterial soaps, right? And it's like a vicious cycle. So I'd love to get into with you guys a little bit deeper about everything related to thyroid disease. Um, I have a few resources to offer. So my Hashimoto's The Root Cause book that came out in 2013, it's a New York Times bestseller. We've got thousands of patients that have now reviewed it. And this is something that you can give to them. They can take this and they'll be on board with functional medicine once they read this. So the best emails I get are from doctors that say, hey, I had a patient come in with your book and they're actually asking me to do functional medicine testing. They're actually asking me to do more testing and like it gets them motivated and gets them on board. Uh, my new book is coming out March 28th, Hashimoto's Protocol. And then the Thyroid Secret documentary series that's coming out on March 1st. And in this series, we have nine episodes that go through misdiagnosis. They go through um, postpartum thyroid issues and help take people back on a recovery to get their health back. Um, episode two is actually focused on mental health and misdiagnosis as well. So I think you guys will be especially interested in that. Um, that's all I have for you guys, but if I could leave you with one closing thing, that if you have a person who is fatigued, who is sleeping a lot, you know, think about their thyroid. Don't always say like this person must be depressed. Even, even if they are quote unquote having mood alterations, think about the thyroid. So, thank you guys. I'm going to stay here. We're going to get the thing. Thanks so much, Isabella. We're going to have the uh, panel now. We did run a little bit over, so we're going to have a shorter panel. Uh, we got the. If you guys, all the speakers, want to come back up, and we will. Uh, we got the dream team. We got the psychiatrist back in the house. We got Isabella. Michael's coming up too. And uh, if you have questions in, we'll have a few questions. We're going to have to uh, cut it short here. Grab, grab yourself a chair. I'm going to pass this over to you. Here, please. Oh, no, it's all right. Um, Michael, you want to rock up here? All right, I'm going to pass you guys the mic here. Chanel, I just want to start with you because you've got innovation in telemedicine, but I know one of the things that we're always trying to encourage is group work, group visits, um, the way that you know groups of people are working together. Can you just share a little bit about how you've managed to sort of meld the world of, of telemedicine and groups? Sure, you bet. Um, I actually started doing groups because it's a great way to get the to get the help to where the patients are. So you can see the patients in their houses, in their offices, and it's a great way to reach populations of people who are otherwise hard to reach, like busy professional moms, um, because then they can make time for self-care if you can bring it to them um, via telemedicine. So um, my own group program actually started back when I, I wrote a book a few years ago um, about the seven foundations of health and happiness, and it was... The core message is basically letting go of perfect and trying to balance a little bit in all the important areas of your life instead of trying to just completely nail one and leave the other sort of neglected. Um, and what I found was is that in working with people one-on-one, -on -one, they actually needed more support to apply it to their lives. And because I had already done some work with groups in um, my training with the Center for Mind-Body Medicine and some other models, 
it just seemed like a natural fit. So I put together an eight-week program um, that goes through all seven foundations and a, and a week for behavior change. And then we tested that out in a public mental health clinic in rural Colorado. And we actually just published the results of that in the Journal for Technology and Behavioral Health. Um, and what we basically found, there was a lot of, a lot of results, um, but the most interesting ones to me were the qualitative results, and that's that the patients they felt that it was a practical way to learn stress management skills, they felt that it contributed to their relationships and their quality of life, and the interesting part was that they all, um, there were actually no dropouts from any of our two groups, which if you've ever done any group work, that's really unusual. Um, they all found it very satisfactory, and when we asked them specifically whether they felt that the telemedicine group experience felt real to them, we got unanimous yeses. So I was really excited to hear how much they enjoyed the group, and I love the idea of telemedicine group therapy because you can bring it to wherever the patient is, no matter how far out in the middle of the boonies they, they live, you can bring telemedicine to them. And the group actually cuts down the cost, so more people are being seen at once, so you've got the cost barrier reduced, but then, ironically, they're actually getting more connection time because they're having more face-to-face -face time with the doctor. So it's kind of a win-win on both sides. Plus, you have the power of the group. I really do believe that groups can heal and can help us do things that we can't do on our own, and you get to harness all of that. So I see it as the way that we can bring functional and integrative medicine to the masses in a way that's going to work. I think you've just had a, a moment there. That is the future of psychiatry and, the, and really the future of functional medicine, using technology, using groups. Thank you so much for sharing. I think that's really powerful. Michael, I'd just like to ask you, you know, Michael runs the Boulder Functional Forum Meetup Group and is a, 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 a doctor of acupuncture for you know decades. You heard earlier um, Scott Shannon talking about his group, his team that he had. What do you feel like the, the Chinese medicine provider adds to a, a sort of a, an integrative team that wouldn't be delivered from like a team of pharmacists, psychiatrists, and naturopaths? Yeah, I think the, the beauty of acupuncture is many levels to it, but it's one of the modalities like bodywork therapy, which is where I started, uh, that gets in under the radar of the mind, where you're connecting with a person uh, where they're not, they're not mind to mind, which has value, addressing belief systems, traumas, attachment styles, all the wonderful things we learned about, but you're getting a connection to a deeper level of the person's being and where the, it's not primarily a mental experience. Uh, and if you've ever had a massage and kind of dropped into that place or had an acupuncture treatment and dropped into that place, there's something profound that can happen there. And Chinese medicine innately, inherently, is a uh, mind, body, spirit, heart uh, medicine. Uh, and so ideally, we're, we can treat a patient from the, the most superficial levels of their symptoms to the deepest level of their being, so that more of them becomes embodied and expressed, more of the largeness of who they are uh, becomes expressed in their lives. So I consider uh, a Chinese medicine modality, acupuncture is, is, is very beautiful if the practitioner has that orientation of being, seeking to touch a person at the deeper levels of their being. So I, I really consider it an essential uh, part of a person's journey of healing. That's awesome. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and real value in thinking through the cases from just that other, other perspective too, right? Well, yeah, because in Chinese medicine, when, when we talk about the organ systems, we're talking not just about the physical liver, but we're talking about uh, judgment, uh, the ability to follow through on something, uh, anger, which can be healthy assertiveness or rageaholic. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's different levels, you know, when we speak about the organs, we're sp speaking about those le different levels of being. And, and, and having run a integrative, collaborative, multidisciplinary clinic for 19 years in New York before moving to Colorado, um, I know the power of that collaborative team model. That's how I was trained and that's what I created in New York. And it's, it's profound. And when you hear the, the physician and the acupuncturist and the holistic nurse and the massage therapist, and all talking about the same patients, or at least perspectives on patients. It's, it's a dramatic experience. We just loved our weekly staff meetings because that connection time, that community of practitioners was a healing experience for us too. Absolutely, we get, this is getting a lot of love on Twitter. Uh, Amy Sapolo is a PharmD as well, loved hearing Isabella and having a pharmacist on the functional forum. I think maybe the first time we have, uh, although you were on a panel here last year, and she says, telemedicine in group, what a fantastic idea, provides the power of the group as a practical way to reduce the cost barrier functional, of functional medicine. That's really exciting. Um, Will and, and Janet, I'd love to just ask you, you heard Isabella's talk here on the, on the thyroid 
enjoyed. I'd just love to get your sort of uh, experience of being on the front line of mental health and, and how um, that landed with you. Well, you know, the front line of mental health is a rugged place to be. <laughs> um, but I've really been blessed to have great community, and that's really what saved me. And, you know, I've learned uh, over the years to take time to be with my colleagues, my friends, to share ideas, to um, understand root causes, um, to be able to treat the actual root causes instead of just medicating symptoms. Um, you know, learning about autoimmunity and the gut and, and psychiatry and all of these connections, inflammation and trauma, it really just brings everything together. So it's much more fulfilling to practice this way. And um, it's especially uh, enjoyable to do it in community. Just uh, the most fascinating thing that Jenna and you talked about in my mind was this bi-directional way of, of the way things go in different directions. How confusing is that going to be to doctors who are very much trained in sort of a linear way of thinking that this causes that and there's no other real side effects? I mean, I'd love to get your thoughts on how we can, how we can communicate ideas that are quite foreign to a wider physician audience. I have a lot of faith in the ability of physicians to absorb this information. I think it's just not out there that uh, trauma is a pattern that exists in the nervous system that changes the entire body. And physicians have adapted to the idea of leaky gut and autoimmunity and uh, environmental toxins and all kinds of things. And I think we can adapt to this too. We just have to put this on the map. We need uh, emotional trauma to have a seat at the table so that uh, this person is a member of the team, and I agree with what you said about acupuncture. In my experience with acupuncture, I think uh, that the you know the beauty of Chinese medicine is that it treats people simultaneously. You know, with a single elegant you know needle, you can treat someone on a spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental level all at the same time. And uh, so it's a it's an a, it's an Eastern medicine concept that we can incorporate into functional medicine where we think of all these things happening simultaneously on non-different levels. Something's happening spiritually and emotionally for the patient. It's also happening in their body. It's not like two things happening. It's one thing happening. And so I think uh, your point is a good one, but uh, I've been impressed by the, the uh, you know, prairie fire of functional medicine excitement spreading across the country and I think we can incorporate this into that. Absolutely. Isabella, last word to you. I mean, you, you've sat here and listened to, to their talk and, and talked about the, the future of psychiatry. Uh, how did that uh, meld with, uh, you know, what you're seeing? Obviously in a position where you're just talking to way many, way more people than, you know, the average physician every day through social media and your email marketing and a book and everything. Wow, I just have to say I'm so excited about the future of psychiatry. I, um, this is a dream come true for me that every person who gets told that they have these quote unquote symptoms or these diagnoses that we can take that label away from them and we can give back, give them back their health. And this is what functional medicine can do. Absolutely. Any, any, uh, yeah. Let me just, you want to add something to that, Michael? Oh, uh, just a uh, short plug. I'm starting a six week course uh, for practitioners uh, called the autoimmune mastery program this Thursday. Uh, so if you'd like to join us, just go to uh, autoimmunemasteryprogram.com. Awesome. All right, so a big round of applause for the panel. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, as I said earlier, we really want to get the Functional Forum meetups humming. There's so many meetups watching tonight. If you've been watching at a meetup, thank you. I know we've gone a little bit of time over. Um, I can smell the uh, paleo food coming from the kitchen below, so I know that it must be time to, uh, to wrap up. The next date that we have is the evolution of cardiology. As I started, where I'm going to you know, finish is that you know, we have in Dean Ornish's model an, a model where integrative cardiology is available on Medicare. And if you have a a coronary condition, you can get that care. You can have six providers work on you and Medicare will pay for it. I think we've seen tonight that the future of psychiatry is very rosy. And thanks again to the whole team. And thanks very much for coming out and being here. This is the Functional Forum. Good night.